I was drafted, 1968. What was your reaction when you got drafted? Well, one of disbelief as a, as a high school kid, I, once I graduated from high school, I really, even though Vietnam War was going on, I felt at that time I wasn't going to be drafted. And I think it was wishful thinking mm -hmm. because after I got drafted, uh, I knew a lot of people were going to Vietnam. So when I did basic training, I still wishful thinking thought in my heart of hearts, I was going to go to Vietnam because I just felt that as a kid, I just didn't think I was going to go, wishful thinking. I got my orders to go to Louisiana for advanced infantry training, which is, you know, that's a red flag, advanced infantry. And in my heart of hearts, I thought, I'm going to be one of the few people that doesn't get sent to Vietnam. Then when I got my orders for Vietnam, I realized in my heart of hearts, I was going to Vietnam. So, but it took three and then the final thing, see it, see it in writing, convinced me that I really was going <laughs> to Vietnam and I, I was scared to death. Did, what did like your parents think when they found out you were going to Vietnam? Uh, my dad didn't know because I come from a broken home. So my dad left when I was, actually my mom left my dad when I was like eight years old. My mom brought up three boys by herself. She was a, a blue collar, worked in a factory lady. Who, and I'm sure she was concerned like any mom was back then because they were starting to televise what was going on in Vietnam on a daily basis. People were seeing their sons and daughters killed on TV, so. What were you going to do if you didn't have to go to Vietnam? Honestly, I, I really didn't have any plans. I, I, I started drinking heavily when I was a junior in high school. And I remember when I graduated, I had one goal, and that was to keep on drinking. And uh, I, I was well on my way to, to being like an alcoholic, if, if not already there. And I was just, I think there was an anger there. I didn't like the fact that somebody was going to tell me how to dress, how to comb my hair, cut my hair, when to eat, when not to eat. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to Vietnam and, and having no control over that was really, really made me angry because I grew up with no supervision. My mom was going to work in the morning. I brought myself up, my two brothers and I, and uh, I loved it. And there was nobody telling me when to go to bed, when to get up, when to go to school, and all that stuff. So the, the infringement on my freedom was uh, something I really detested. So when you were younger, what did you think when you're starting to hear about the Vietnam War. I think then again, not, it, was, it, it wasn't me. I mean, I, I, came, I come from a small town, and I think a lot of people, they just, I didn't think I was going to be the one to go. But I remember as a 10th grader, my gym teacher, you know, he would sit me down and we'd goof off as the class was going on because I was one of his favorite guys. And he'd, he'd look and he said, you know, Mick, he says, and this is 10th grade, he says, some of those guys, when they graduate, they're going to go to Vietnam. And I, he, he said that to me and I said, you know, he's, he's kind of crazy. But, you know, two years later, not just me, but some of my friends, you know, were, were in Vietnam. So I didn't think he knew it at the time that he was kind of like a prophet. But small town guys, it was common. You know, if you didn't go to college, if you went to college, you, you got a college exemption. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was definitely smart enough to go to college, but I never saw that as a, an option. I, I was just so into my, I lived my life in bars, you know, and looked at the mail occasionally. And then when I got to my draft notice, I realized, you know, the, the fun is over. What was one of your favorite things during basic training? One of my favorite things. <laughs> Gosh, I wish I could think of something. Because they, they literally owned you like 24 hours. And you know, I got 
I, I, we had an opportunity to get uh, like a three-day pass if you got really high marks on your, um, we had a, a physical training test that involved climbing bars, uh, running around a track a mile with like your combat stuff and carrying a rifle and doing a low crawl and everything. And if you scored, the possibility was like 500 points. And if you scored over a 450, you could get a three-day pass. And so I, I like, I'm wired, I, I, I'm a phys ed guy, so that, that appealed to me. So I got like a 470 something. I was just looking forward to going on that three-day pass. So I, I think, I guess ha having the possibility of going home was really great. And like in basic training, you know, there was no, there was no getting away for drinking. There was no getting away for pizza and ice cream. You ate what they gave you and you didn't go anywhere else. I, I lost 25 pounds in eight weeks. And when I, you know, I was an athlete, but the drinking kind of like didn't help with that. But when I got out of basic training, I, I felt strong. I, I, I knew like, they're preparing me for something mm -hmm. that uh, I would have never preferred. I think it's kind of like being an athlete and a coach makes you do some stuff. Well, they made me do it, but um, the 25 pounds came. And I, I mean, when I got out of basic training, I mean, I, I looked like a 19-year-old soldier should look. And uh, our, our training was hard. Guys who um, didn't pass the training they were held back another eight weeks and they would send them to the fat farm. Now, that was the word they used for the guys who couldn't pass the physical training. You weren't gonna go on to advanced training. They would send you and eliminate anything that was extra and you would go to the fat farm. Now, I don't know what they did after that, but after basic training, I had a couple of weeks off and you know, drank for a couple of weeks, went to advanced infantry training and it was really hard physical training. But at five o'clock in the evening, you were done for the day until like six the next morning. And I just couldn't wait to get to the barracks, get changed and go into town and drink. After nine weeks of basic training, I gained 30 pounds, even with the physical training and everything. But I, because I had from five in the evening till six the next morning to eat and drink everything I wanted to. So when I got through advanced infantry training, I looked worse off than when I got drafted. <sighs> Two perspectives on that. When I went over, I think more so, yes. When I got over there, no. And I guess the third perspective, now looking back, totally unprepared. Because some of the situations I got into um, were things I was told to do and should have used maybe better judgment. Um, for instance, you know, being out and coming upon um, like a compound where the Vietnamese had been and going in there and, ex and expecting that they were still there and people just like running around doing various things and yelling and screaming at each other but being told to check out a foxhole or a tunnel. Well, um, in the movies and everything, you, I don't know if you've, you've seen the uh, fire in the hole. You pulled a, you pulled a pin on a grenade and, and you tossed the grenade in the hole. And that's, that's, a, that's how you're supposed to check out a foxhole. I had never been told to fire in a hole thing, never watched, really never watched a movie. I dropped my weapon got down on my, on my stomach and crawled halfway in the hole and uh, crawled back out. And that was the first time I think, as I look back, back then I didn't think about it, but um, uh, that, that could have been really <laughs> bad. So I get out, um, I remember the fellow who told me to do it, I think it was like a, one of the platoon leaders. I forget what he called me, but it wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, this is how it's done. He pulled the pin on a hand grenade, yelled fire and hole and threw it in there. And I remember being so mad that I said, this guy was willing to like, let me do that, knowing that the possibility of, of somebody being in there or a booby trap, because they always booby trap the tunnels. 
So that was, there was a kind of a mixed feeling there of that was being unprepared. Um, I ended up in the first air cav, which is an air mobile group, infantry. They jump out of helicopters and are, are taken to what were, if there's like a skirmish going on. The, the cab is called, and they can get us there in minutes. Well, they would take you there, and you would jump out of a helicopter. I mean, they would get you down to about 12 feet or so from the ground. They didn't land very often. And you would jump, and never really thought much of it back then, but I was never told, after you jump, what do you do? Now, watching my favorite movie, We Were Soldiers Once, with Mel Gibson, it's all about the first calf, and the movie is, it explains the training they went through, the first calf, where they showed him actually going through the, the training of going and jumping off a helicopter, and where to go, and what to do next. And I, after watching the movie, I said, boy, that would have been really helpful. So there, there was a few times, those are a couple I, I recall that um, would have really been nice have that information. What was your MOS in Vietnam? Okay, MOS was the designation they would give you of what your job was over there. For instance, I was an infantryman, so that they were called 11 Bravo. That was the term, 11 Bravo. Artillery people would be different MOS. Uh, people carried mortars would be different MOS. Supply people would be dim MOS. Everybody's job even a cook would have an MOS. But if somebody said 11 Bravo, everybody knew you were infantry. And with the infantry, it would be carrying a weapon like an M16 or, and I'm not really sure about this. I, I got stuck carrying the machine gun, which is an M60 machine gun. And when I got stuck carrying it, they never asked me if I was 11 Bravo. And I never asked what am I now? You know, am I a 11 Bravo plus or whatever? So even to this day, um, when people say, what did you do over there? I said, well, I was infantryman. I ended up carrying an M60 machine gun. But if they were to ask me, what was your MOS with the machine gun? I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't know how to answer that. All I know is that I, I was carrying the machine gun. Well, the 11 Bravo, like you were put in the infantry traveled by themselves. In other words, a company of infantry would be like 100 men, a normal company, to 120. Then they would divide it into sections, into platoons. There'd be four platoons, A, B, C, D, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. And then you would be assigned to one of those platoons. Then the platoon would be s split into squads. A squad would be maybe eight or nine people. Nine people made up of a squad leader, who was usually a sergeant, um, a radio man. Every squad had a radio man who traveled, you know, next to the officer. And then an automatic weapon. M60 is considered an on automatic weapon. So that you would have two M60s in that squad, and the other four people would be generally carrying um, an M16. So when I traveled, when, they, when I d went out and did something, it was usually in a squad group, so there'd be nine of us, and that would be the makeup of our squad. If we went out on a patrol, that's what the patrol, there was always uh, your squad leader, there was always a radio man, and there was always two machine gun people. And in order of the pecking order, if you go out in a squad, um, you, were, you were taught that the most important person in that group was your radio man, because he was the one who could call and get you help. So as, as important as your squad leader was, if, if they were to shoot the radio man or kill him and somebody else didn't know how to use the radio, you were, you were all alone. And so when they stuck me with the machine gun, the guy next <laughs> to the radio man is the machine gun guy, the guy carrying the number 60. So back then I didn't think anything of it because I was so scared of everything. I didn't have time to think, you know, theoretically or, or philosophically, what does this mean? It was like, my life was the size of this room. That, that's 
you know, it, it didn't matter to me what was going on five miles away um, because there wasn't anything I could do about it or 200 feet away. All I had in control of it was what, what was in my general area. And being a first air cav with the, with the helicopters, um, that changed really quickly because if somebody was in trouble 10 miles away, we, we would get a call, the radio man would get a call. They'd send in helicopters. If we weren't doing anything, in other words, we were just out on patrol, they would send the helicopters in, pick us up, you know, in, a, in like a friendly manner. We, we weren't doing anything, and then drop us in the middle of uh, you know, like a firefight that was going on. And that, you know, that was a downside of the helicopters were like really nice to have to get you out of somewhere. But the, the other side of that coin was they were the ones who brought you there to begin with. You didn't normally um, walk into something, at least in my, in my unit. And, and what I'm expressing is something that I was only there eight weeks. So my recollections of what went on over there are based on eight weeks, just eight weeks of experience of being there and then 50 years later of, you know, piecing together some things historically of what the first air cab did as a bigger unit, but mostly within 50 feet. Did you have any favorite foods when you were in Vietnam? Yes. I'm glad you asked that. I, one of my favorite foods that I was eating over there was uh, everything came in cans. And they, they had uh, pound cake in a can. And we would, tr we would trade, like I would trade for pound cake. You know, and they'd have you know, like fruit cocktail and peaches in a can. And um, if you can picture this, they also had what they called like long range uh, reconnaissance patrol food. They put it in like baggies and they were frozen dried food. And one of my favorites was spaghetti in a bag. And you would just put it in a, in a, a can and you would add water and just cook it. So one of my, that was one of my favorite meals, but pound cake by far was the best. What type of photos did you bring with you? Oh, okay. Um, I did, uh, in December of 68, um, is, is my vivid memories. I was drafted in October, or drafted in May, and went over to Vietnam on October 20th of 1968, which happened to be my 20th birthday. And I remember going over and crying on a plane all the way to, uh, to Chicago before I pulled myself together. Um, and kind of, I was kind of hiding behind a newspaper so people wouldn't see a, a grown man who's a soldier going to Vietnam. Like, I was, I was so sad. But I, I remember um, getting over there, and the first month was, was scary, but nothing happened. And then November... I guess it was like Thanksgiving Day, we had a mortar attack, which kind of like, from that, that kind of that kind of put my, uh, I guess my thought process and everything in, into a whole new um, realm of like, of fear. Because up from October to November, middle of November, I hadn't seen or heard anything. We were just going out every day and whatever. And then November, I know it was Thanksgiving because we didn't stay in one place very long, but I remember the whole company was uh, out in really heavy, like, jungle. And when we got into heavy jungles, we traveled. It would take us, like, the whole day to go 100 yards because somebody who was at the front would have a machete and actually cutting through bamboo and jungle and stuff. And I remember distinctly, like, that Thanksgiving, um, we got to a clearing, and clearings are, are really um, convenient for setting up, but it's also convenient for like ambushes, because if you set up in a clearing in, in the midst of a jungle, if you, if you are the enemy and you look at a map, um, the clearing is, is really distinct. You can see where the clearing is. So when you do, for instance, a mortar attack, they, they do that in grids, and so on a map, they could actually grid um, 
the whole perimeter, the whole, the whole open area. And one of the things I said, well, poor training was we, we set up camp, 120 men, and uh, along the outside of the perimeter of the opening, there was a, uh, a stream. And the stream is like, you know, a stream can be like two feet wide or eight feet or 30 feet wide. And they had a B-52 strike in that area. And the B-52s are the huge bombers that they would just drop like 500 pound bombs in certain areas. And what happened was before we had gotten there, there was obviously a B-52 thing because all the way through the streams, you would come to an area and it would be like the size of maybe 20 feet around and it would be like almost like a little pond and so we we never got to uh like take showers you know we would go out nine days no showers no change of clothes so when we saw water it was like you know like like disneyland you know it's time to get wet it's time to get clean that type of thing but i remember that day uh we helicopters were coming in all day bringing in um packages from home you know, everybody, moms and dads were sending Thanksgiving packages, you know, cookies and cakes and, and like tapes from back home, you know, cassette tapes. But I remember that day because it was in the middle of the afternoon and like everything was kind of quiet, but people were just, you could tell everybody was in a good mood because everybody was talking. And then we, we started to hear like the thump of, a, uh, of mortars. And there, there's a distinct sign, sound that mortars from that are coming in, the mortars going out, and it, it was incoming. So guys started yelling incoming, and so it was like, you know, we we I think there was like 15 people in this little pool, and like everybody is naked, right? Because the clothes are there, so we're scrambling. You know, I remember just putting my helmet on, you know, because you 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 know you gotta cover your your head. And I went to jump in my my foxhole. There was like four guys already there. Now you're told to dig your foxhole like <laughs> four feet, six feet deep, because you know, it, otherwise, you know, it's not serving its purpose. And when you get lazy and tired, uh, and you said, and I, my foxhole was like this deep, and it was like four guys in it. So I just jumped on top of the guys, and I could hear the mortars coming closer, like they were walking them down the stream. And uh, I was just laying there scared. I just had my helmet on. I'm the top guy. There's three guys, four guys underneath me. And then the mortar stopped. You know, they stopped. For, I, and I don't know why they stopped. Um, because it was like, pro it felt like it was just like 20 feet away. I could hear them coming. They were walking them down the stream. And I don't know. God's providence, whatever. But that, that, that put me on alert for the, the remainder of uh, of my time in Vietnam, which was short, but after it was over with in the afternoon, um, one of the strategies that the, that the Vietnamese and Viet Cong used was they would have a mortar attack, cause confusion because generally there were people injured and you'd have to call in helicopters to rescue people, and then they would do a ground attack at night. They would follow it up, and I remember being taught that. And I was on guard duty that night, and I was so scared because we were right by the we were right by the stream, and I could hear, I could hear the stream, I could hear the the water, and all I could visualize was it was making such a noise that my mind was saying, they're they're, they're coming across the stream. That's what you're hearing, and I stayed awake all night. I, I couldn't wait for the sun to come up, and I couldn't wait to get out of there the next day, and. Uh, you know, from there, we, ju we just walked out of there, and it was like, as I look back over the years, it was like watching a, a, a movie where something bad happens, and the guys kind of like walk out in a daze the next day. And I, I, I had the feeling that it was just an eerie feeling, like that was my first taste of something like really bad. And I, I just, I don't know if I ever recovered from that until I, until I got home. But I, I remember walking and, and being super alert um, from November into December. But the photos, I, that's a long one of the photos, and, and it, it's, we, we, got, we were only supposed to go out for nine days at a time before they would bring us into a base camp. And I have had some photos 
and it's of uh, myself and a fella that I wish I knew who he was, but I don't. And when I thought about that and bringing the photos, I said, I, I, can't, I can't remember one person that I was with over in Vietnam. And, and thinking about that is like, I think that when you were a new guy, people didn't want to get close to you for a number of reasons because you were going to do something that wasn't very smart, that you weren't going to be around. I think they were afraid of making friends. And number two, I think a more sinister viewpoint for me, I don't know how I got stuck carrying the machine gun. Um, I wasn't trained for it. I, I shot it on the range and everything, but I don't know in my squad in the, in the middle of November how I, how I got stuck carrying the machine gun. And, and, the, and the sinister, skeptical part of me says, I was the new guy and they were going to stick the new guy with it. And that's, that's a, a theory I have, but I also had to walk point. And walking point is when you're the first person in your squad um, going in an area where you haven't been before. And I was scared to death. I was scared to death I was going to stop in a booby trap. Um, I was scared to death if we got an ambush, I'm going to be the first one that's going to be ambushed. And I had to do that for one day, but one, one day was enough. And uh, back then there was a movie out before basic training called Green Berets. And I made the mistake of going to see that in the Green Berets. It was about us in Vietnam. And uh, everything I saw in that thing, I was like, oh my gosh, these people are really stupid, meaning our troops. And then I saw us doing what they did in the movie, and I'm like, this, this doesn't look good. I don't know if they'll, um, two of the pictures, I'm write, I know I'm writing a, a letter either to my mom or to my wife, and it's at a base camp. I'm leaning it against a, an embutment where we, we put the, the sandbags. There's a 50 caliber um, machine gun, which is a, is a, you don't carry that around. That's set on a base in a camp. And on the end of the 50 caliber machine gun is, is sitting a little Santa Claus. He's about this big, and I got him sitting there because my mom had, I guess she wanted me to be happy about Christmas. So he's sitting there, and I'm writing the letter. I have a photo of me eating something, <laughs> paper plate, and uh, it looks like a meatball. But whatever it is, it's about this big, and that's all there is on a plate. I don't know if I was halfway through my meal. Um, one of my favorites that I had blown up um, is me. I look, I look like a soldier. I have uh, my battle stuff on my helmet. I have bandoliers of uh, machine gun, 60 caliber um, ammunition and holding on to my uh, M60 machine gun. And I'm standing by some birch trees. I had it blown up. I have one at school and my wife uh, had the picture put on a coffee cup, and it, uh, it's a reminder, because on the cup, my, my wife has a, a verse from Ecclesiastes, and it says, uh, There's a season uh, for everything, and for me it was a season of of growing up. Growing up really fast, um, but also, um, of, of a thankfulness that I made it through Vietnam in, in one piece, basically. And I became a Christian when I was 23 years old. And so God put a whole bunch of different things in my life and gave me a different I guess perspective on my life of how much I have, how little control I have, but also of the blessings of 
getting through something like that. So when I look at my cup and it says Ecclesiastes, I, and as I get older, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the different seasons I've gone through. I, I have seven children and seven grandchildren, and uh, I've gone through the seasons of being a young guy, you know, just a high school kid, to uh, going through Vietnam, getting shot, coming home, uh, almost a wrecked marriage because of my drinking, and God saved me through the drinking and restoring my family and being married almost 50 years now. Um, I can see God working in my life and that the machine gun picture, I think it's that because that reminds me of that season and the verse reminds me of it was just a season. I, my, my life, that was just a, a small snapshot of uh, literally a small sh snapshot of a life that was 50 years ago, but is really vivid in my mind. Santa Claus thing I like. And I have a picture of me and uh, three of my buddies. I only remember one guy's name, Larry, when I got shot. Uh, it was December 15th, and I was in a hospital in uh, Vung Tau, Vietnam. I was asked if I wanted to go to Japan, because they were going to send me to Japan. And I said, I'd like to stay here until after Christmas with the guys. So I stayed till December 27th, and they nicely sent me to Japan. And, I, and from Japan, I stayed, and they sent me home from Japan, which was probably one of the happiest days of my life, because I knew once I got back here that I wasn't going back again. I had only been there 56 days, and so I still had a year of service to go, and they could have sent me back. And I got home, and I, I told my wife, I said, honey, if I, if I get orders to go back, I'm not going back. I made my mind that that was enough for me, that if, if they were going to send me to jail, or if they were going to, you know, like, there was options, you could go to Canada, be a conscientious objector. And uh, those, those were the two things that I was considering. Um, had bad dreams for probably five years, and the dream was that they were sending me back. And I kept telling them, you can't send me back because I've already been there. They didn't, I was, the dream was they didn't know I'd been there, that I was out of the service and I got drafted again. I was like Groundhog Day, going through the whole thing all over again. And I kept saying to them, you, now I've already been there, and, uh, and I'd wake up in a dream, and there was never any, uh, any resolution to that. I, I, I told them, but in a dream, I always woke up before either they said, you know, no or yes. I never, and then I stopped having the dream. So it, that was kind of weird. So the pictures are just me at a base camp. I know they're all like a week before I got shot because um, th that much I do know because and I wish I kind of brought the letter. I wish I brought the letter. I wrote, I wrote my wife a letter on the day I got shot, before I got shot. It's, one, it's the only one I have. Um, I wrote her a lot of that letters you know, for the seven weeks I was over there, but that's the only one I have, which is really ironic or strange to me because I read it now and then, and, and like I remember vividly where I was, what I was doing, and then just to have that is kind of like, I don't know if I want to use the word cool. It's nice, it's nice to have that. So those are the pictures. There's like five of them in uh, bittersweet memories, I think, of uh, my time over there. Why did you leave early? I left out an important part. Um, December 15th, 1968, we were walking down a red, like, dirt road, mud road for days. And that's so rare to do that because if you're an infantry outfit, it's sort of like going down the main route, road in your town and saying, shoot me, you know, because there was a whole company, and I, to this day, I was wondering, what in the world were we doing? But we did that for like nine days, and then one day, just out of the blue, they said, uh, you know, we're, we're taking a, a right-hand turn <laughs> into, into like really heavy jungle, and immediately we took the turn. We're, we're in, like from walking on the trail, to like using machetes to cut ourselves through bamboo and vines and everything. 
And I, I remember a guy who was like two, two people ahead of me saying, I hear something. And he was a short timer. And a short timer is a person who's been over there and he's like within a week of going home. And uh, it, it was customary from what the guys told me, like when you're a short timer, you start getting really antsy that you've been really lucky so far to make it that long. And I guess part of it's superstition because nobody wants to get killed with a week to go. And so they said, you start hearing things. Well, this is the guy who's saying, I hear something. And the guy ahead, he's between us, he said, he hears stuff all the time. So, I mean, so we, we were like moving like 20 or 30 feet. And he said it a couple more times. And then an, uh, an AK-47 goes off. AK-47 is uh, the Vietnamese weapon of choice. Uh, it's a Russian made it's similar to our M16, where we would, we would give our infantry M16s, they would give their M infantry AK-47s. They're so distinct, you can, you can like, the record, if you, a guy who's been in the Army can, can hear an M16 and an AK-47 without looking and hear the, the, the sound difference, it's a difference. And so we were lead squad, so we were the first ones in the whole company going in, and so customary, we, as soon as we got fire, we just laid down on the ground. We're in bamboo, facing this direction, and can only see this far in front of us because it's heavy bamboo we've been cutting through. And so there's nine of us, side by side, a couple of machine guns, I've got the machine gun, and rules of engagement is, lieutenant will say, you know, base, uh, line of fire, and you, you fire your weapon on automatic for about five to ten seconds. So you've got nine people firing in one direction for about 10, 15 seconds. Then there's, you stop firing, and there's no, no noise, there's nothing, there's quiet. And then the lieutenant, squad leader, says, okay, move out. So that means get up and, and start moving. So we get up, and as soon as we get up, we start to get AK-47 fire again. Back down within a second, and the same process of lay down the base of fire, 10 seconds, automatic weapons, quiet, lieutenant says, move out. And we get fire again. So on a third time, lieutenant says, move out. And nobody's getting up. We were just late, nobody's getting up. And he yells louder, I say get up. He must, I don't know how many times he said it, two or three times. And I, I don't know if I was just being stupid or if I was assuming the rest of the people were gonna stand up. I stood up. And as soon as I stood up, I got shot. I, I felt the pressure. I, I, I got hit in the left arm on this side. And when I went down, I was so scared. You know, people said, did, did it hurt? I said, I don't remember it hurting. I was so scared. I think the adrenaline was fine. And my thought was, whoever shot me knows where I am, and he's just gonna keep on shooting until I'm dead. That was my thoughts going through my head. And in reality, as I look back, I said, I, I don't think he could see me. I mean, if, he, if we couldn't see that far in front of us and there was nine of us sitting side by side, I, I think it was just somebody who was just Viet Cong, just in, a, in an area where we were heading into more Viet Cong and he was just like a, a patrol type guy, outlook. And I, don't, I looked back and I said, no, I don't think he did. But back then I didn't know any better. So a medic crawls up to me. I'm just laying there, and I, I'm just scared to death that somebody's going to shoot me again. And uh, he said, can you crawl? I said, yeah, I can crawl. And uh, all I know is I crawled backwards with him, I guess maybe 40 feet. It probably couldn't have been too far because of such heavy stuff. I, I think he, I remember leaning me up against a tree. He said to me, you have a million-dollar wound, you know, sort of like Forrest Gump. And I, 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 I thought, well, I guess that's good news. And there was absolutely no pain whatsoever. I was so scared, the adrenaline was flowing. He gave me a shot of morphine. And within seconds, like, everything was like, and I, I, I know, I, I remember smiling, because I, I, I just felt so good. And, and then everything became a blur after that. We, because we were in heavy bamboo, there wasn't any place, they called in a medevac. Uh, chopper, like the Red Cross, we, they put them things out and, and they're just perfect targets for Viet Cong. They love it when the helicopters come in. Uh, the rules of engagement, uh, 
are, you know, you, you don't shoot Red Cross, but they do. They, they shoot Red, they shoot doctors, they, they love. That was just, it, it wasn't like a play by rule war, you know, it was just a dirty war. But uh, I know they were, they were chopping with machetes a space big enough for a helicopter to come down. Now, the helicopter couldn't land because they couldn't go all the way down with it. So it had to be, uh, they had to chop it so the helicopter could come within four or five feet so they could load me on the, on the and I don't know how long it took because of the morphine, but I remember them <laughs> putting me on a helicopter and I was face down on a helicopter, just laying face down. And uh, the helicopter took off and I heard, I heard the pilot say, um, I've got one more stop. I got to drop at a hot LZ to pick up somebody, and and my heart sunk because a hot LZ means there's a, there's a firefight going on, and he's going into a place worse than where he's picking me up from. And to my knowledge, like he never did. I I don't know if I I passed out from the morphine or or whatever happened, because my next memory is, and I don't even know if it was that day, the next day, or three days. I don't know when it, the, when it was. But when I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. I, they, they'd sewed me up, and I was laying in a just really clean bunk. It was in Vietnam, it was in Bang Tao, in an army hospital. And I looked around as I was laying there, and I looked, and the, the guy next to me had looked at me, and he had the biggest smile on his face. And I, I couldn't believe it because it was a guy that I was with in basic training. And uh, we just both laughed. And, uh, I said, you know what, we really had bad training because here's two of us, 56 days into Vietnam, we're both shot already. And uh, we just laughed. And uh, that was my recollection of, of getting shot. I, I ended up coming home because, and I, I see uh, things in, in God's perspective now of timing of where I got shot, when I got shot. I got shot in December of 1968. Going back almost a whole year uh, in January, they had the Tet Offensive in January, which was uh, a countrywide attack on all the bases in Vietnam uh, by the South or by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong and the NVA. And it was to demoralize uh, the troops. They attacked in the cities. And what happened was they wounded so many Americans that. The hospitals were filled in Vietnam. The hospitals were filled in Japan. They were anticipating another Tet Offensive. Now, this is a perspective I had like later when I got out of the Army with that. Because of that, they, the guys like me who had like minor wounds, I consider a minor wound, that would have stayed in Vietnam and, and until we got better and then gone back in the field, they took as many of those guys and sent them to Japan. So I ended up in Japan Hospital and every day somebody would come in with orders for people to go back to the United States or orders to go back to Vietnam. And I just, I think it was close to 10 days. Um, I was laying in bed every morning uh, expectantly but also dreading uh, going back. But the, the wound I had, even though it was a flesh wound, I, had, I have like eight stitches here, but I got shot from here all the way down here. so I've got, I counted the stitches one day, it was like 31 of them. And the scar here is really, really narrow. The scar down here is about this wide, because so, it ripped the skin open. And so they put in uh, metal stitches to hold, hold it together better. And I, <laughs> I remember when they took the stitches out because I cried like a baby, because they left them in too long. And um, when, they, when they took them out, they, they had to use like the wi wire cutters and it's not like pulling thread through your skin. They're actually, it's actually metal stitches. So when they, they pulled the metal through, uh, if the metal, it didn't come through smoothly. It just brought blood with it as it came out. And I was, I know I was in tears from, I just couldn't wait till they got them all out. But I knew, uh, you know, maybe gonna be here for a while. And then, I, then I got my orders to go back home um, to Fort Devens. Army Hospital. It, it was like one of the happiest days of my life. I came back to the States, uh, S Super Bowl, when the Jets played uh, the Baltimore Colts and Joe Namath called the game that he was going to beat the Colts and everybody said, oh, you're crazy, Joe. 
and they beat the Colts. And it's, it's one of my fondest recollections of uh, coming back in January. And then the night of the Super Bowl, they woke me up in my bed because they like to wake you up to see if you're sleeping well. That's how the Army does things, like a regular hospital. And they woke me up and made me get out of bed and they quarantined me. I found out I had malaria. My first day back in the States, I almost died from malaria. I, I lost 30 pounds in 10 days. I thought I was going to die. And I thought, I, ironic that I should go to Vietnam, get shot, recover, come home, and die from a mosquito bite. I thought like, of course, my God, do you, is this a sense of humor or whatever? But um, I, I don't remember ever in my life being that sick. I had the dry heaves because I couldn't eat it. The thought of eating something made me throw up. And so I got the dry heaves, which is your, your stomach starts to convulse, like you're going to throw up, but there's nothing in there. And so I'm doubled over in the bathroom um, with the dry heaves. My, my eyes are bloodshed, bloodshot because the, the, vein, the, the vessels in my, in, my, in my eyes broke. I mean, I, mean, I was like almost completely red, both eyes. And, uh, you know, it took me 10 days um, to, to get over the malaria. I, had, I was freezing and sweating at the same time. And I, I remember, like, I wanted to go home. They wouldn't release me because I was still going through the sweat. So the doctor <laughs> was coming in the morning. I drank a whole, a whole glass of ice water, hoping that my temperature could go down so I could go home. And uh, didn't tell him I did that. And he took my temperature, temperature and he said, you're not going home, your temperature's 104. And that really scared me because I knew I just drank a whole, whole glass of ice water and I didn't tell him, but I stayed in the hospital two weeks there and I, I got a pass, you know, I got a pass to go home and whatever, but I, I ended up spending five months in, the, in an army hospital, both for the wound healing and the mosquito, <laughs> the mosquito incident. So that's why I ended up coming home. I, 56 days in Vietnam. I wish I had kept my helmet because we all decorated our helmets and I had a calendar and I was crossing off X's. And I, the, the letter I have to my wife says, I only got 309 more days to go. That was the morning before I got shot. So I, I know ex exactly how many days I was over there because that's the, that's the day I got hit. So I'm a record keeper. How did you adjust to normal life after you finally made it home? Coming home was, was such a happy experience for me. I, I grew up in a small town and people welcomed me back. I, I know historically looking back that a lot of like military guys were mistreated because they thought you know, like you know you got called baby killers and stuff like that and I, I never experienced that. I mean I, I grew up in a small town where people knew me since I was eight years old and so they, they welcomed me back. I, I don't even know I never experienced that. I know it happened because I've read a lot about it and everything, but I was so happy to be home. And then, you know, my experience, I had another year to go here and it was in the middle of my alcoholism. So um, I have those bittersweet memories of being totally oblivious to everything. You know, I just didn't care about anything. All I wanted to do was to get to that next drink. And when I was drunk, I was happy. And then I go through it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I really don't feel like I had trouble adjusting. And, I've, and over the years, I've told people that, you know, I was an alcoholic. And they said, well, Vietnam probably make, made you an alcoholic. And I said, no, it didn't. I said, I was an alcoholic before I went over there. And people have always, in China, I think soft pedaled and saying, like, you know, you probably had a family history of that. And I'm like, so what? <laughs> My dad was an alcoholic. And I said, I never used... My dad is an excuse for being an alcoholic. I drank a lot because I loved it and then counted the costs later on and uh, it, it was different. But I, I, was, I felt accepted when I came home. I mean, I got free meals in town and people bought me beer. They, you know, it was, it was good to be back. If you would have gone back, would you have just gone back differently, like <laughs> for a different reason? I, 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 I under no circumstances 
could even entertain that thought. When, when I came back home, I mean, I, it was entrenched in my mind that there was no way I, I was going to ever put myself in that position again. Um, there were a few things that I had settled in my heart, but that, that's the one that comes to the top. I can't think of anything else that I, that I felt so strongly about. And it has, it, it doesn't have anything to do with whether the war was right or wrong or whatever. It has to do with staying alive. I knew how fortunate I, I had been to come back because, you know, 50,000 guys were killed over there. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands, and I know there's guys walking the street today, you know, who are homeless guys who uh, came, came back and had a lot of baggage, who probably saw a lot of action. They probably saw friends get killed and terrible things. And I, I count that as one of the blessings that I didn't experience. I, I would probably have a totally different outlook on life. Maybe I would be one of those guys. My brother went to Vietnam. When I came back, he spent a whole year with the first air cab. If my brother had been killed in Vietnam, I would probably have a whole different perspective and care a whole lot more, maybe be angry, you know. But I didn't, I lost some classmates over there, but no really close friends that I could say, but I knew guys I went to school with. And uh, I, I think perspective is relationship-wise. If, if you lose somebody really close to you, you you have much stronger feelings on it, so. Boy, it's really, it's really hard, you know, because thinking back, thinking as a, I'm almost 70 years old, you know, if you don't think differently by the time you're 70, than you did when you were 18. Um, I, I think you've missed a lot of life and, we're, and uh, that you haven't grown as a person. I've been really fortunate in having a supportive wife all these years. Back then, it was just, it was the 60s. There was a lot of turmoil going on and there was that battle of should you go or shouldn't you go? I never held any animosity towards guys who didn't go, who conscientiously said they were conscientious objectors. I, I never, because I had a couple of friends who did that, and I, I didn't hold it out against them. I, I think it took a lot of courage to do that, just like it took courage to go to Vietnam. And if you believe in something, sometimes you're willing to die for it. Sometimes, uh, in other people's opinions, it may not be something you should die for. And I think as you get older, there are fewer and fewer things that you're willing to die for. You know, I have, I have seven kids and seven grandchildren. I'd like to believe that I would die to protect my kids. I can't say that about a lot of people in my life. Um, but the people who are close to me, I, I, I would hope I would do that. But, and back then, I was thinking like an 18-year-old. I didn't know anything. All I knew was basketball, baseball, and swimming that's all I did so uh, yeah it's really hard to do that put myself in that place put the two perspectives yeah stop camera is there anything that we didn't ask that uh, that you wanted to address or anything that no I you know I've kind of like made peace um, in my life and I think the most important thing that if, if I wanted somebody to like remember in, in my discussion about Vietnam is um, where I am today is only because of my faith in uh, to name in Jesus that if, if Jesus hadn't come into my life, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a happy guy. Um, I'm, I'm blessed for sure. And I look back on my Vietnam experiences. I wouldn't choose to do it, but I'm thankful that I got through it. 
Um, so everything I have to put in perspective of, uh, of my life is I am thankful that I'm, I'm able to sit here <laughs> 50 years later and be able to share, you know, some hard times I went through. And I'm a very emotional person, and I don't talk much about it, um, about Vietnam, because it isn't just Vietnam that I'm emotional about. I'm emotional about everything. I'm, I'm a passionate person, for better or worse. Um, I'm quick to anger. I'm quick to laugh my head off. I, I know what forgiveness is. And the, and the key to being thankful is to get, that, get yourself to that position in your life where you realize that most of us, just sitting in this room, have a lot to be thankful for. Um, there are a lot of other places you could have been born, myself included. Um, this is a great country without being political about it. A lot of men and women have died for the freedom that people are expressing today, maybe in a negative way, but a freedom nonetheless that they're guaranteed because of, of military people who, I mean, I could say that about, you know, if you're a historical person, you can say that about the rest of the world, that this country saved you know, from, from Nazi Germany and, and, and uh, communist country and all that stuff. And I, I just wish people here would be more, and I guess I'm speak, speaking in a historical sense that I think that some of the historians have kind of twisted some things around, but I'm going to leave that. <laughs> I'm going to leave that for you guys to deal with. <laughs> so I want to thank you for the opportunity to share it, John, and you guys. It was well, we a blessing to, blessing to, to me. You're a lucky so. man. Oh yeah. Good luck, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. Untethered.